Limerence is a wild, delirious ride. It's a spectacular infatuation, an obsessive form of love. It's an altered mental state that supercharges you and changes your whole perception of the world. When you're going through limerence, it's like your brain has flipped into a whole new mode. It's fizzing and popping and overloaded. So what's going on? Well, in this video, we're going to break down the neuroscience of limerence and how key neural systems work together to create that unique mental state of love intoxication. Hi, my name is Tom Bellamy. I'm a neuroscientist and writer, and I blog all about limerence over at livingwithlimerence.com. I'm also the author of the book Smitten, that explains the neuroscience of limerence and how to make sense of obsessive infatuation and how to recover from it. Right, let's get to the bottom of what's going on in our brains during limerence. So being in limerence comes with a whole set of symptoms, things like euphoria, exhilaration, an insatiable desire to be close to this other person, a sense of extraordinary connection to them. It's like you've been struck by a love thunderbolt. So all of those symptoms can clearly be explained by neuroscience. Limerence is happening in our heads. That other person might seem magical as though they've cast some kind of love spell on you, but of course that isn't really what's happening. So let's make sense of what is going on in our brains during limerence. So a simple way of thinking about the brain is as a system of systems. So our brains have defined circuits, defined regions and systems for regulating key emotions and behaviours. So things like fear or hunger or aggression and so on. When it comes to limerence, there's three systems that we really need to consider. The first is arousal. The second is reward. And the third is bonding. Right, let's start with arousal. So at the simplest level, arousal is just about whether you are awake or whether you are asleep. Okay, so that wakefulness process is actually controlled by quite a lot of different brain regions and different neurotransmitters, but overall it's regulated by what's called the ascending reticular activating system. But we're not really interested in wakefulness, we're interested in a sense of exhilaration once you're awake. And that is largely focused on a particular region of the brainstem known as the locus ceruleus. So this is a cluster of cells that project to lots of other different regions of the brain. And these cells release the neurotransmitter noradrenaline also known as norepinephrine. And that is the key transmitter that regulates arousal. Now, one of the important regions of the brain that the locus ceruleus regulates is the hypothalamus, which regulates a lot of the kind of basic bodily functions. So it's an interface between the brain and the body. So activation of the hypothalamus by the locus ceruleus uh, leads to release of adrenaline into the blood and the activation of what's known as the sympathetic nervous system. And that causes all of those symptoms that would be so familiar, the racing heart, the dilated pupils, the sweaty palms, the sense of anxiety and excitement all bundled together. So that's why we feel amped up and hyped up when we're limerent because the arousal system has been switched on very powerfully but the arousal system does also regulate the function of the brain itself and it's almost like a kind of excitability dial for the brain so our sensory processing is enhanced our cognitive functions are accelerated are speeded up so it genuinely is like a different mode of operation in the brain when arousal is in full flow. Our thoughts race, our heart races, everything together gets us like ready for action and hyper aware and hyper alert. Okay, the next system to consider is the reward system. So this is quite well known because the reward system is based around the neurotransmitter dopamine. And dopamine obviously is talked about a lot in magazines, on YouTube, in, in newspapers, 
But there are a number of misconceptions about what exactly it is that dopamine does in the brain. So dopamine is often thought of as a pleasure chemical, but that isn't really right. It's actually about motivation, about driving us to pursue rewards. In actual fact, the details of how dopamine operates are, are very interesting. Uh, dopamine is really about reward prediction and errors in reward prediction. So you'll get a big release of dopamine in the brain if you have an unexpected reward. So let's say you, you come across a, a, a juicy fruit and you eat it and it's delicious and sugary and feels fantastic, that would lead to a, a release of dopamine. In the same way, somebody that you're attracted to smiling at you in a particular way can cause a big release of dopamine and that's signaling this was a reward that I wasn't expecting. However, over time, you begin to learn that certain stimuli, certain cues in the environment are associated with reward. And then dopamine switches the way that it operates a bit and it drives you to seek reward. So you'll get a release of dopamine when you think there is a prospect of reward that will stimulate you to pursue it. If you secure the reward, fantastic, everything's working as expected and you've learned successfully what things are rewarding. But if you don't get the reward, let's say you get that fruit and it turns out that it's sour, that decreases dopamine release in the brain as a signal that you didn't get the reward that you were expecting. Overall, what this means is that dopamine is acting as a motive force. And in fact, the anatomy of the reward system is in some ways similar to the arousal system. Again, there is a particular region, a cluster of cells in the brainstem known as the ventral tegmental area that release dopamine. And again, those cells project to multiple other brain regions, the most important of which when it comes to reward is known as the nucleus accumbens, which is part of the striatum. And the striatum is a brain region that's very important for the learning of habitual behaviours. So you can start to see how these things fit together. Once you've learnt that your limerent object is rewarding, you'll automatically pursue the reward-seeking habit of trying to get contact with them. Now, dopamine also uh, is released in the executive centres of the brain. So there is another pathway that goes from the ventral tegmental area, this time to the prefrontal cortex, and that helps us make sense of rewards. So it allows us to kind of understand the context in which a reward is secured and rank the significance or the importance of different rewards and things like that. So there is both a forward signal from the ventral tegmental area to the prefrontal cortex and signals back from the prefrontal cortex to the nucleus accumbens that regulates reward seeking. Again, we can see how that's going to be relevant for limerence. And there is one last um, nuance of the reward system that is very important. And it's that dopamine doesn't directly cause pleasure itself. And what this translates to in terms of our experience of reward is that wanting and liking are distinct functions in the brain. So how much you want something isn't always directly linked to how pleasurable it is. Wanting is what dopamine does. So there is a phenomenon known as incentive salience, and this highlights how important a potential reward seems to us and therefore how much we want it. Dopamine is going to be regulating how much you want something and it's the motive force that drives you to seek that reward, to seek contact with your limerent object. So the third system is the bonding system and this is the hormonal element of limerence. So there are two hormones or strictly kind of neuropeptides, neuroendocrine factors, um, released from the brain, oxytocin and vasopressin. Again, oxytocin is quite well known. It's often popularly called the love hormone, and that's because oxytocin is released during intimacy and, and it, it regulates the process of bonding. 
So to go to the anatomy of the bonding system, we go back to the hypothalamus, and there are cells in the hypothalamus that release oxytocin and vasopressin, both into the blood via the pituitary gland and back into the brain. So again, the cells from the hypothalamus project into multiple other brain regions, and so oxytocin and vasopressin release can regulate all kinds of aspects of our neuroscience. So oxytocin and vasopressin also have lots of other effects in the body. So they're involved in regulation of the kidney and blood pressure for vasopressin. Oxytocin is important for the initiation of labor during childbirth and uh, let down of milk during nursing. So within the brain, um, oxytocin and vasopressin are involved in pro-social effects on mood. So things like uh, building trust, a sense of affinity and bonding to other people. And in fact, oxytocin in particular is released by intimacy. So things like skin to skin contact or bodily warmth or sexual touch. In fact, uh, a lot of oxytocin is released at the point of orgasm as well. So it's a way of generating bonding, intimacy and affection. Okay, so those are the three key systems that explain the symptoms that we experience during limerence. But the brain is a system of systems and they all communicate with one another. Everything is interconnected. And this is our experience, of course, of these different processes during limerence. Intimacy is pleasurable. Bonding is rewarding. We seek arousal because it feels good. It feels stimulating and exciting. So all of the, even at the level of the anatomy and the neurotransmitters, there's a lot of crosstalk and these processes all regulate each other. I think it's worth highlighting though, one really big factor that's relevant for limerence. The reward and bonding systems can work together to make a particular person a uniquely powerful source of reward. And that is the heart of the formation of a pair bond between mates. Now, most of the evidence that we have for the neuroscience of pair bonding doesn't unfortunately come from people. It comes from prairie voles. So as it turns out, as a quirk of nature, prairie voles form strong monogamous pair bonds that last throughout their lives. And so by studying prairie vole neuroscience, we've understood a lot about that bonding system. And what appears to be the case is that there is a very strong synergy between the reward system and the bonding system when they are activated together. So what that means is when bonding to another person, when intimacy with another person feels especially rewarding, that imprints a very tight and lasting association. Now, as I say, the evidence for this is mostly from perivals. It's not altogether clear how it applies to humans, but humans are unusual among primates in having social monogamy as a very common and popular mating style. Okay, so those are the processes that are going on in your head during limerence, quite a carnival of activity and neurotransmitters and signaling. But even that is not the whole story. There are going to be other influences too. So things like serotonin or testosterone or libido or erotic uh, stimulation. But all of those factors are actually much more complicated and not quite so clearly linked to the onset of limerence. However, there is more on all of those topics on my website on livingwithlimerence.com if you're interested in really going deep into how all of those factors might be involved in limerence. But even with all those details, we've only really covered the very beginning of limerence, that exhilarating, euphoric, positive early stage of the process. And limerence isn't just that thrilling early phase. Unfortunately, it can progress into something nastier, a, a life dominating behavioral addiction. And in fact, it's these same systems for arousal, reward and bonding that are involved in that transition into a behavioral addiction. That's gonna be the subject of the next video.
how limerent intoxication can become addiction to another person. And there'll be a link below and a card on the screen when that's ready. Okay, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you want more and I'll see you next time.